Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this edition of the NITEX Colloquium. Uh, my name is Francesco Petruccione, and I'm the interim director of, uh, of NITEX. Yeah? Uh, this afternoon, we are really very happy to, to have with us Dr. Eder uh, Kikianti. I hope I pronounced it cor correctly, Eder. Correct. Yeah? <laughs> Eder um, was born in Indonesia, where she studied uh, mathematics at the Bandung Institute of Technology. After her master's, she moved to Australia, where he did her PhD in mathematics at the Victoria University. <clears throat> and uh, after that, she worked for a little while at the National uh, ICT Australia Institution. And then she moved to South Africa. And now she's based uh, uh, at the University of Pretoria as a, as a senior lecturer in, uh, in mathematics. And uh, Ida uh, wrote uh, recently uh, a very nice article on the on the history of mathematics uh, in South Africa. Yeah, and uh, when I saw that, I thought this is a very nice topic for an for an index colloquium, uh, and Ida very kindly immediately uh, agreed. Yeah, so here we are today, and uh, Ida, people are here to listen to your interesting talk and not. To me wasting their time so if you would like to share <laughs> your screen you're, you're, you're welcome to start and while you do that i quickly remind the, the participants to make use of the q a facility to ask questions and maybe to raise their hand and then we can let them ask the question at the end of the talk so um either please you're welcome to uh, to start your your presentation thank you very much <clears throat> Thank you, Francesco, and thank you for um, giving me the opportunity to present um, this uh, this talk. So um, I wrote this article, or let's say two articles. Um, the project started around 2019 or so. So I am by no means a historian. This is something that uh, I got interested in. And then we collaborated actually with a histori historian from Oxford, which, um, one of the uh, paper that um, this talk was uh, is based on. So the paper is uh, now published at Mathematical Intelligentsia. And uh, I wrote this with Tomoko Kitagawa. Uh, she was at the time in Oxford, but she will soon change affiliation, but still working in the area. Um, and the second uh, paper that I based this talk on, so it's basically amalgamation of multiple um, projects. Um, another paper that's already published is in the notices of the AMS, where we talk about the national rating system of South Africa um, and how we can see mathematics from the mathematics of South Africa from that lens. And I am uh, collaborating with Loiso Nongka. I hope I pronounced it correctly. <laughs> um, and uh, here's a photo of Loiso. And uh, some work in progress with Loisa also made it into the, this talk. So I just want to acknowledge my collaborators before I start. Okay, so very briefly, um, I myself is not South African. So when I started the project, it's very important to learn the historical marks of South Africa to put everything into context. So here I have a timeline, not to scale. I try my best, but um, here, here it goes. So um, here there are some historical marks that I need to point out before I start my talk so we can put things into context. So um, from the period of 1652 to 1795, um, what is now South Africa was a colony of the VOC. So this is the Dutch East India Company. And uh, after that, um, in 1795 to 1803, it was taken by the British and it became British Cape Colony only to be taken back again by the Dutch uh, and became the, colo uh, the colony of the Batavian Republic. And in 1806, it's back to the British uh, colony. This also known, this period is also known as the second occupation of the British. So this is 1806 to 1910. And in 1910, um, the four provinces uh, that were the Cape Colony became, sorry, that were a colony of, of uh, British, including the Cape Colony become Union of South Africa which became fully sovereign in 1931. 1948, there's another uh, important uh, historical mark there. Um, the National Party elected to power, and this is the beginning of the implementation of apartheid law. In 1961, um, the, it becomes now the Republic of South Africa until today. And at the same time, also South Africa left the Commonwealth. And apartheid ended around about 1990. Um, 
well, officially the uh, election was 1994, as we all know, uh, but I'm just going to put 1990s as the uh, end of this period. Okay, so I'm going to try and focus on, um, to talk about mathematics of South Africa. And here, I just want to make a claim that when, when I say mathematics here, what I mean is university mathematics, or, or uh, let's say modern mathematics and not uh, ethnomathematics. Okay, so I will speak briefly from the period uh, 1652 to 1806. Um, and then I will mainly focus on the period from the second uh, occupation of the British colon uh, colony until the end of apartheid. So that's basically what I'm gonna look, uh, look at today. Okay, so let's see um, from the beginning uh, days of the Cape Colony. So the early settlers at the Cape in the beginning, they were tasked to produce food for the crews of um, the Dutch East India Company uh, who are on their way from the Netherlands to what is now known as Indonesia. Um, so yeah, um, they stopped by in, in, this, in this area and in need of refreshment, so to say especially fruit, because scurvy was a big problem at the time. And the early settlers uh, later have a little bit of agric agriculture challenges um, because this, they usually settle around the, well, they were settled around the Cape and they later slowly move into the interior of South Africa. And this movement led to a number of discovery, including unusual flora and fauna, rich mineral deposits, and some fossils. And this become uh, this place then become a hunting ground for visiting scientists. Okay, and at the time, uh, there's not really any schooling, so to say. Um, there were basically scientists coming to collect um, specimens and would go back to Europe, and there's no institution, there's no uh, scientific institution, there's no schooling, and so on and so forth. Um, Although there were a little bit of education provided during the Feotse rule, and um, there's only a few private secondary or Latin schools. And in terms of the, the educating the leaders at the, at the time, this was supported by the motherland. So uh, at the time, there, there's no necessity or they feel like there's no necessity to have a schooling or proper institutionalized schooling system in the Cape. Not until the second British occupation um, that this become institutionalized. And then um, in order to do that, a position called Superintendent General of Education was appointed. And um, the first uh, SG was James Rose Innes, who's actually a mathematician. Um, and the third SG is also a mathematician called Thomas Muir. So or, already in the beginning of, um, of South African education, mathematicians were heavily involved. And later there were some state aided schools um, that were mainly established uh, in, the, in the Cape. And this were later expanded to other regions like Natal and uh, the inland region. Okay, so that's the, on the schooling side um, during this, uh, this period. But what about scientific institution? Well, um, they also realized that, okay, we need to have a permanent scientific institution because there are lots of things here that we can uh, learn about the land and other things. So um, the first permanent scientific institution established in South Africa was the Royal Observatory of the Cape of Good Hope. Present day, it is the South African Astronomical Observatory in Cape Town. Here, there's, I put a picture here of uh, one of the telescope that I took when I visited in 2019. So this uh, was the first um, institution that was established in the Cape. This was in 1820. Okay. And then there were some few other um, institutions to follow in the South African Library in 1920, sorry, in 1822, and the South African Museum in 1825, followed by the South African College in 1829. And this is the, this is the beginning of uh, the University of Cape Town, which became university in 1918. I will come back to that in a little later. And there's also a scientific society form uh, one of them, or let's say the most prominent one at the time was the South African Philosophical Society in 1877, which became um, the Royal Society of South Africa in 1908. Okay, so I want to focus now on uh, this place here, the Royal Observatory, 
because this was the beginning also of mathematical research. So at the time, um, there were some uh, astronomers appointed uh, as the Royal Astronomer at the observatory, and uh, some of them were educated in mathematics and used their mathematical knowledge uh, in astronomy to basically uh, do the work. So the very first person that was appointed as the Royal uh, Astronomer is Farron Fallows. Here's a picture of Farron Fallows that, uh, that uh, is still now in the library of South African Astronomical Observatory. Fellows was educated in Cambridge. He was third wrangler in 1813. So for those of you probably familiar with, uh, with the terminology, um, you probably know what it is, but in case you don't know, wrangler basically means that you graduate um, the top. Um, the first person is usually called senior wrangler, and then second wrangler and third wrangler and so on. Okay, so um, 1813, um, he became third wrangler in his education. And there are two famous mathematicians that became uh, the senior wrangler and the second uh, wrangler. Uh, there's, they are uh, John Herschel and George Peacock. Both of them are um, his contemporaries. And also another famous person, not graduating in the same year with, uh, with fellows, um, but studying the Cam at Cambridge at the same time, uh, was Charles Babbage, father of computers. So Babbage, Herschel, and Peacock, actually, um, they were um, very close, and they formed the Analytical Society in 1812. At the time, they tried to campaign to change the syllabus in Cambridge from using Newton calculus and change it to Leibniz calculus uh, to follow the mainland Europe. That's basically what they're trying to do. And they try to get fellows um, to, to be involved as well, but he uh, did not want to be involved officially. Um, but he, there's some evidence that he actually supported uh, this change. Okay, so he's uh, quite an influential person. And then he was appointed as the first royal astronomer uh, of the Cape of Good Hope um, under the recommendation of Herschel, who was at the time also involved in um, establishing institutions in uh, the Cape Colony. Okay. I want to mention a couple more of the Royal uh, Astronomers. Thomas Henderson is the next person. He was from Scotland and he became Royal Astronomer from 1831 to 1833. And Henderson was probably most famous for being the first person to measure the distance to a star using the stellar parallax method. Um, although I would like to point out here that some people would probably dispute um, the claim that he was the first person, which I will explain in a moment. So this um, publication by Herschel um, was out in 1839, even though the observations already started from 1832. Um, he delayed the publication because he wanted the measurement to be verified by his successor, uh, Thomas McClear, who later became also Royal Astronomer after Henderson. Um, and at the time, um, Friedrich uh, Bessel, so to say, beat him to it. He published a parallax for 61 Sydney in 1838. So if you look at certain literature, they would say that Bessel was the first person to use this uh, stellar parallax method. But some other historian would argue that it's actually Thomas Henderson. Okay. The next person I would like to uh, talk about is Sidney Samuel Hugh uh, from England, a uh, British applied mathematician. He's Royal Astronomer from 1907 to 1923. He started with no practical knowledge of astronomy. He was only educated in mathematics. But later he compiled um, five of the 12 volumes of the Southern African part of the map of the sky. So here already we could see that um, having the observatory in South Africa or in this region contributed to the field of astronomy um, for one. Um, and this is contribution from, um, from basically from an institution being geographically uh, located in South Africa. Okay, and Sidney Samuel Hughes also um, then uh, became a huge influence um, for the country because he was the first president of the Royal Society of South Africa. Okay, and there's a whole story about um, the funding scheme and all, all that, but I do not have time to go through uh, this in this talk, so maybe some other time. Okay, uh, so 
as we can see here, there's already an influence coming from um, the, the institution being in South Africa. But I would also like to mention um, that later on, the mathematics um, so around this time was in some sense influenced by the mathematicians being in South Africa. And by that, I mean the following. So in 1886, uh, gold was discovered in the Witwatersrand area. And because of this, um, the South African School of Mines uh, was established to basically uh, educating people in, in, in mining. And the school started in Kimberley in 1896, and it moved to Johannesburg in 1904, which then renamed as Transvaal's Technical Institute and later become University of Witwatersrand. Actually, one of the campus um, was open in Pretoria and that became uh, University of Pretoria as well uh, in 1908. Okay, but how does um, finding gold or having mining have influence in the mathematics? So I'll just pull up one example. Um, a mathematician by the name of Anthony Starfield, born in 1941. Um, he's currently resides in Minnesota. And uh, his doctoral thesis was to study the thermal deficient equations for heat in the deep mines, basically to do temperature control in the mines. So you can see here that um, his uh, work was, um, let's say, uh, inspired by, by, the, by an actual situation that you need to solve in the mines. And he later taught a course at Wits University uh, on numerical methods for rock mechanics. Also something that's very important when you're um, working in the mines. Um, but Starfield, not only interested in mining, but there's also another aspect of, of South Africa uh, that he's very interested in, namely the animals. He's also interested in uh, mathem mathem sorry, <laughs> mathematical modeling in game reserves. Okay, and I would like to point out here that um, before this time, mechanics was the only field of study in terms of applied mathematics. So with um, this development, then there are more um, fields of mathematics, particularly applied mathematics being introduced in the country, and they all came because of the interesting situations that we have or the interesting um, things that we have in South Africa. Okay, I would like to acknowledge Professor David Mason for giving me all this information on Professor Starfield. Okay. So now um, I would like to come back to the higher education um, because as I said in the beginning, we want to also discover how mathematics in universities developed. Um, so in order to talk about universities, we need to talk about the education uh, in the country. So let's build up the context first. So um, the origin of universities in South Africa basically started with a few, or let me say a couple of institutions. So there were colleges, like I mentioned earlier, South African College, became, which later became University of Cape Town. But there's also Victoria College, for instance, in Stellenbosch, uh, which later becomes Stellenbosch University. And there were other colleges um, in the country, and their main purpose is to teach. They, so they educate the people in South Africa. But they do not conduct examination. The examination, well, started with the Board of Examiners and later taken by the first university in Southern Africa, which was the University of the Cape of Good Hope. Uh, established in 1873. This is the, um, the precursor to University of South Africa, UNISA. Okay, so um, not only that um, University of Cape of Good Hope doing examination, they also uh, can award degrees to people. Okay, so um, the sort of um, role of teaching were done by, um, was done by colleges, the role of examination and uh, awarding degree is done by University of Cape Hope could hope, and they do not provide any education. So this is very different from the modern um, universities that we have here. Okay. And after 1910, there were some colleges that were granted full university status, um, main, uh, namely um, UCT, Stellenbosch, and also UCGH become UNISA. And attached to UNISA, there was a uh, university college, there was the University College of Fort Hare, established in 1916, and this cater mainly for educating black students. So already at that time, we see a little bit of segregation happen. Okay, so um, let's take this uh, uh, slowly. So first of all, I want to speak briefly about uh, colleges. Who are the people that came to South Africa or that were in South Africa um, teaching uh, the students in these colleges? 
Um, a lot of them were from Scotland um, or England. And I would like to give an example um, of such a, of such, uh, such a person. Um, is, this is French, uh, Francis Guthrie. He was the first person to post the four color problem. He was a student of the Morgan and he uh, was the chair of one of the colleges in South Africa, uh, the uh, Graf Reinhardt College from 1861 um, for 14 years. Here's a painting of Guthrie um, that I received from um, one of his descendants who work actually in, in Pretoria. Um, Guthrie also um, promoted education for women because he believes that uh, women, even though they work as, at the time, most women work as housewives, they deserve education because they are actually the ones who are educating the children. So they deserve good education and he promotes for women to be educated. Um, thankfully, things have changed. Okay, and later Guthrie uh, became interested in botany. And in fact, some of the famous species in the country were named after him. Quite an influential person. Okay, so th there are, of course, many people that I can mention here. Um, I just chose Guthrie because of the um, interesting uh, connection to the four color problem, which I think a lot of mathematicians, maybe in the audience, um, uh, probably already know, um, and probably this is something that piqued your interest. Okay, all right. So let me get back to talk about um, degrees in mathematics. So as I mentioned, University of Cape of Good Hope uh, conferred degrees to people. Um, what about degrees in mathematics? And let me just focus on advanced degrees in mathematics, namely from masters and, and PhD. Um, are there these people who receive such, uh, such uh, degrees from UCGH? The answer is yes. The first person um, we found on the record is Hendrik uh, Johannes Lowe Dutoy. He's the first person uh, who received Master of, Master of Arts in Mathematics and Natural Philosophy in 1878. For, unfortunately, he did not continue uh, with mathematics. Then there was um, John Patrick Dalton, who received Doctoral of Science in Mathematics from uh, University of Cape of Good Hope in 1916. And um, there's another person, let me just pull up the name and then I will explain uh, the context here. Um, the second person is Ebenezer Stegman, who's also received the uh, Doctoral of Science in Mathematics from University of Cape of Good Hope just a year later. Okay, so Dalton was actually working at Leiden University uh, apologies for not um, writing down that carefully. It should be Leiden University um, in the Netherlands. Uh, around 1910, he was there and he was working on van der Waals uh, equation. So after he did this research, he came to South Africa and because UCGH actually did not um, provide the education, it is hard to say that um, his doctoral of science or let's say his dissertation was advised by someone who's from South Africa. Okay, and same goes with Sekman. He actually went to Germany um, to study, but then his study was disrupted because of the First World War and he had to return to South Africa. So in these two cases, we can see that, yes, they, are, they were awarded degree, um, doctoral degree in South Africa, but were they really trained by South African or let's say mathematicians who were based in South Africa? This is very hard to speculate and most likely the answer is no. Okay. Uh, concerning Stegman, he uh, did not work on, math uh, on mathematical research. Uh, later, he actually, um, one of the people who were involved in writing textbooks for mathematics in Afrikaans. Okay, so relating back to what I mentioned earlier about um, having doctoral training in South Africa, I want to pull up a quote by Hislop, who is a Scottish mathematician, and he was the head of the department of mathematics um, at Wits University around about uh, 1948 when he mentioned uh, this statement. So I'm gonna read it to you. Uh, it was not really possible to do mathematical research in South Africa and consequently local universities should focus on providing their best students with a good undergraduate training before sending them overseas for higher degree work. So at the time really the norm uh, in South Africa is to send people overseas to study and then they perhaps they will return back to South Africa and can um, then train the new generation. So that was the idea. Okay. So the main destinations for uh, study 
um, for South African students were um, the United States, the UK, of course, and the Netherlands. Okay. So I would like to mention uh, one prominent mathematician that went overseas to study, namely Stanley Skews. So he um, was born to British immigrants. So he's born in South Africa. And he uh, graduated from UCT. And then he, uh, he actually had an engineering degree. And then he went, to, he went to Cambridge to do mathematics. And then he came back to South Africa and he was working at UCT. And he started a research on prime numbers. And he wrote a paper. What's the paper about? I will mention in just a moment. But this paper was published in 1933. And this became a basis for his doctoral thesis in which he went back to Cambridge to study. And um, what is in this uh, paper became known as the first Cusis number. It is quite easy to explain, so I'm gonna explain it very briefly. Okay, so this, uh, I would like to thank the UCT um, mathematics department for, uh, for pro providing us with the pictures, um, photo of uh, Skews in the previous page. And this is handwritten by Skews himself. Uh, explaining what is Skews' number. Okay, so we have pi of x, this notation, basically means the number of primes less than or equal to x, and the logarithmic integral, Li of x, is defined the following way. You basically take the integral of one log one over log t dt. Uh, let's just be careful here from zero to x uh, with some singularities, right? I'm not gonna go to the details. But the point is here that um, this uh, Li x is a good approximation for the prime counting function. So this is uh, also known as the prime counting function. Um, and as far as at, at the time, as far as calculations suggest, um, pi minus Li is always negative. So of course you do this by hand and then um, as far as they could, they always show that pi minus Li is less than or equal to zero. But in 1914, Littlewood proved that pi minus Li changes sign infinitely often as X goes to infinity, but the proof gave no indication where the sign changes happen. Okay. In comes Skews, and he was able to show where the sign, cha the sign change may occur. And this is what's known as Skews' number. So you, you see here on the right-hand side is the full memorandum from Skews about the Skews' number. And he showed that uh, the first Skews' number is 10 to the 10 to the 10 to the 34. Okay. So for X no larger than that. And this is the first Q's number, which is proved without assuming, sorry, with assuming the Riemann hypothesis. And he later improved upon his own work and the second Q's number um, with a weakening uh, Riemann hypothesis um, is 10 to the 10 to the 10, sorry, 10 to the 10 to the 10 to the 1000, really big number. Yeah, and which uh, Hardy noted that the Skews' number is the largest number which has ever served any definite purpose in mathematics. So there's one contribution in number theory by a South African mathematician. Okay, let's get back to Skews and let's get uh, to know him a little bit better. He was supervised by Littlewood in Cambridge. And uh, Littlewood himself actually grew up in Cape Town. His father was a headmaster of a school in Cape Town. And um, when he was about 14, if I'm not mistaken, um, he was sent back to England to study there. And Skews, while studying in Cambridge, um, was into rowing. He likes uh, rowing. And his uh, contemporary and his uh, rowing friend, so to say, someone really famous, was Alan Turing. He wrote with Turing in Cambridge, and um, they basically set one behind the other. Um, and they often had discussions during training about the zeta function, um, basically just talking about mathematics while uh, rowing, which sounds fun. And then he returned to the UCT after he graduated uh, in 1938 with his PhD. After the war, he reunited with Turing when he visited in Cambridge. They actually wrote a paper but this was never published. It's actually in one of um, collection of Alan Turing's works. Um, you can find this paper. And um, in Skews's collection um, of papers uh, after his death, um, they found a letter from Turing to Skews dated 1953. 
um, let's remember that date for now, 1953, okay? Uh, and in the letter, Turing wrote to him about um, rowing, speculates about nature of existence and philosophy of mathematics, and complains about the niggling details of computer programming. So um, because maybe some of you here are uh, mainly work in computation also, maybe you will appreciate uh, this quote. Let me read it to you, uh, what Turing wrote to Skews. I spend most of my time nowadays working in one way or another in connection with a computing machine. It is a rather niggly business in a way like publication. If you have a single hole in the wrong place on the tapes you punch, everything goes wrong. And whereas a reader will forgive two or three misprints, the machine forgives nothing. That was his complaint. Um, there's no reference or hint in the letter about the personal tragedy that um, happened to Turing um, the, following, uh, the following year. Uh, he committed suicide. And earlier in the year 1953, he was convicted uh, for his homosexuality. Um, very, very sad story as we know. Okay. So um, after the two publications, back to excuse, after the two publications that he um, uh, published in 1933 and 55 respectively, he did not publish any more papers, but he was devoted, oh, he devoted himself to teaching at UCT. And one of his students uh, who was in his undergraduate classes uh, was Donna Strauss. So Donna Strauss was born in South Africa. She is now uh, she now resides in um, in in England. Um, her uh, doctoral thesis was one of the initial sources for pointless topology. This was um, her doctoral thesis when she studied in Cambridge. So uh, Donna came to visit us at Pretoria in 2019. Here's a photo of uh, uh, the two of us together. Um, she. Uh, went to UCT at the age of 15, and she was one of the students in, um, in Skews' class. Uh, so Donna, not only a prominent mathematician, uh, uh, especially in topology, uh, she's also known for her activism. She, but, or during her student days, she was anti-apartheid uh, activist, and she was working at Dartmouth College in the US um, as, uh, at the time during the Vietnam War, and she was um, helping some students uh, to get onto campus to have their protests and subsequently lost her job because of that. Um, but she is uh, very strong and she um, is very convicted in terms of um, what, uh, she, uh, what she believes in, uh, strong conviction, and uh, I really respect her for it. And she is now working in, the, in, in, in England. Okay, so Donna uh, also a founding one of the founding members of the European Women in Mathematics. So another South African mathematician that um, makes huge contribution in mathematics, huge contribution in society, and I think huge contribution for women in mathematics as well. Okay, another um, person that went to um, England to study is John Nofmaher. He's a son of German immigrants and studied at Wits University. In his third year, he provided a new proof to the following statement. Every even perfect number is of the form uh, two to the n, multiply with two to the n plus one minus one, where to the, two to the n plus one minus one is prime. And he went to Manchester to study with uh, John Frank Adams and returned to Bits in 1965. Uh, he established the Center for Ap Applicable Analysis and Number Theory in 1992. And after his death, uh, this was renamed as um, John Nofmaher Center for Applicable Analysis and Number Theory. Okay, and one of his students at WITS was Peter Sarnik, another prominent mathematician from South Africa. And he stated that Nofmaher played a big role in putting South Africa on the international mathematical research scene, particularly in number theory. Okay, so those were the two examples of um, people from, well, including Dona, so three examples of uh, South Africans who went overseas to England to study mathematics, and uh, some of them return, uh, some of them not. Um, I would like to talk about some people who went to the Netherlands. Some instances of uh, South African, South Africans that went to the Netherlands to study. Um, so the first person uh, is Jacobus Johannes Grobler, or some of us in the functional analysis community and mathematical community in South Africa know uh, know him as Quiz uh, Grobler. 
He studied at Leiden University, graduated in 1970, and he returned to South Africa uh, to Potterstrom University for Christian Higher Education, present day Northwest University. And uh, of course, and his uh, descendants and his collaborators and so on, um, it's a huge influence for uh, South Africa in terms of the area of positivity. So this is um, the area of uh, the study of ordered vector space and vector lattices and so on. So a vector space with order, basically. Okay. And this uh, is currently one of uh, the active research field in South Africa. Okay. Another student of Zanon from South Africa um, is Peter Maritz, who's, who graduated in 1975 and is currently an emeritus professor at Stellenbosch University. And he wrote some uh, history articles, for instance, on Guthrie. And he also wrote the South African, the history of the South African Mathematical Society, which you can find in the website of the South African Mathematical Society. It's very extensive, very, uh, very um, informative, and also one of my uh, go-to resources for our projects. And I would like also to acknowledge um, uh, Peter's help um, because, uh, because of his help and advice, um, we've done a lot of work in this project. So I would like to also acknowledge him at this point. Okay, let me just have a sip of tea before I continue. Okay. Um, all right, so maybe at this point you're wondering, um, yeah, there are all these students um, from South Africa, went overseas, but there were some people who are working in South Africa doing research and so on. So perhaps there were some people who stay behind in South Africa and do their um, doctor degree in South Africa where there was people, the answer is yes. So I will pull up some examples. The first person that I would like to mention, I will only mention two people. Um, the first person is Hanogun, and he is uh, he was born um, in Germany actually to a Jewish family. They escaped to South Africa in 1933. I think um, you can infer from that year why. Um, he received his doctoral degree from UCT in 1950. Um, from the record that we got. Um, we think that he was the first person to receive PhD in mathematics from a South African university. We're not counting the situation with Dalton and Stegman before because um, the dissertation was most likely uh, written from their research, um, not in South Africa, and they wrote the dissertation, submitted to UCGH and got their, um, got their doctor degree. So um, in terms of uh, who would actually advise in South Africa, and receive their uh, PhD in mathematics, uh, we think that Hanorun should be the first one from our record. So maybe we missed some names. Um, if anyone in the audience have any information <laughs> and some references that uh, or resources, we appreciate uh, the addition to our data. Okay, so Hun uh, worked in on differential geometry of Finsler spaces. And one of the major impact that he uh, uh, gave to South African mathematics. He later left South, uh, left South Africa, actually. Um, but the major impact that he did in South Africa was through uh, the supervision of many doctoral students in many institutions. So he was at WITS, he was at Mittal, at many places, and many people were supervised by Run, um, even people who are not South African. There was a Canadian, one of his students were actually Canadian. Okay. The second person that I would like to mention is Henrika Swart, or uh, better known as Henda. So what? she was the first doctoral uh, student in mathematics that graduated from the University of Stellenbosch. Uh, her dissertation was initially on geometry, but she later switched to graph theory and she became one of the prominent figures in South Africa in terms of graph theory. And she collaborated with many international mathematicians, including Paul Erdos. And she's one of the 511 people with Erdos number one. I believe there are only a few South Africans on that list, maybe two or three. I'm not, uh, I don't remember off the top of my head, but she was one of them. Okay. Um, so uh, here you see some examples of people who also made strong contributions to the international mathematics or and South African mathematics who are educated in the country. Okay. So now I would like to uh, come up to the last section of my talk. And this is the not so fun uh, part of history to talk about. But um, I think at this point, um, I would like to also mention that 
one of the aims of our project is to actually learn from history. So maybe there's a few lessons here that we can learn and make uh, the future of South African mathematics a lot better. Okay, so um, apartheid laws means that South Africans have different rights. I should apologize for the background noise. Um, thunderstorm, at the, there's thunderstorm at the moment in Johannesburg. I apologize for that. Okay, let me continue. Apartheid laws uh, means that um, South Africans have different rights and privileges based on their race. Um, there's classification of South Africans into white, colored, and native or called Bantu people. And later, uh, the Indians would be recognized in 1959. And the most damaging um, legacy, um, I think, was, well, was actually the Bantu Education Act of 1953. This uh, Education Act racially separate educational facilities. And the worst part of it was molding Bantus into compliant citizens and productive workers. So they're discouraged from studying mathematics. Um, let's read a quote by Hendrik Verwoerd. At the time, he was the Minister of Native Affairs and he later became the Prime Minister. I'll read this quote. When I have control over native education, I will reform it so that the natives will be taught from childhood that to realize that equality with Europeans is not for them. People who believe in equality are not desirable teachers for natives. What is the use of teaching the Bantu child mathematics when it cannot use it in practice? That is quite absurd. I think I do not need to elaborate on this quote. It speaks for itself. Okay. So this period actually brought a lot of damage. Um, for the certain uh, for certain people group, but also for South African mathematics in general, because there were academic boycotts happening in protest of apartheid laws. There were a series of boycotts on South African academic institutions. Boycotts include things like scholars refusing to collaborate with South African researchers, or universities refusing South African scholars for visits, or refuse to take South African students, and so on. And so on. And this, of course, created setbacks for South African mathematics because then it, uh, South African mathematics become quite isolated. Mathematicians become quite isolated. And a lot of people also left South Africa in protest of apartheid. Um, so this is very damaging for, um, for South African mathematics. Um, when I interview Arnold Nokmahar um, about his father, uh, he mentioned that uh, his father worked alone for many years and was quite isolated during this time. Okay. Um, during this time, the South African Mathematical Society was founded in 1957, and its goal was to goals were to increase mathematical knowledge and provide support for pro professional mathematicians based in South Africa. And um, SAMS actually uh, did not have any segregation um, into their constitution, they're actually against it. Um, we can read from the SAMS mission statement in 1989, um, but this was, yes, it was written in 1989, but this was already the case from, from back then. Um, that uh, the society believes that the best interest of mathematical learning can only be served in a society which is free from discrimination in any form with regards to race, religion, or gender. So they're against discrimination, they do not like segregation, and as far as they could, um, they try to support everybody. So every mathematician, regardless of their race, religion, or gender. But um, sometimes things are very hard. Uh, things are very complicated, especially when segregation is actually a law in the country. So sometimes the laws of the country put them in an awkward situation, in tough positions to make decisions. In 1962, um, there were some talks about, oh, maybe let's have a separate branch. Of, of, of SAMS for the non-white mathematician, but the council decided that it was inappropriate to, uh, to do so. By 1980, SAMS only had four black members. And I would like to mention one of the notable black member, which was Professor Ismail Muhammad, who became member in 1963. Professor Muhammad was the first black South African to receive PhD in mathematics. He received his PhD from University of London in 1960. Um, he was actually uh, working as a gardener, if I'm not mistaken, for a, for a family, for a white family. And then they noticed his talent 
in mathematics and he started tutoring their kids and he started saving up money. He studied at Wits and later he got bursary from Shell to study in England, um, in London, and he received his PhD in mathematics. Um, he had the option to stay in uh, London, but he decided to return to South Africa because as an activist, he would like to support the anti-apartheid movement. Mathematically, he uh, is a group. He was a group theorist, and he uh, one of his very famous paper from 1968 was co-written with Harman Heineken, um, and a group that they introduced in one of the theorems become known as Heineken Mohammed Group. In 1976, he resigned as the SAMS member. Um, the reason for this is there was an algebra symposium. Well, one of the reasons, actually, many reasons, but one of the reasons was that he was not invited to an algebra symposium at University of Pretoria. Um, even though he's actually an, uh, he's an algebraist. In 1976, there was the Soweto uprising. He delivered an address at the South African students or, uh, Student Organization um, against apartheid education, and he was detained afterwards. He uh, was at the time working at University of Western Cape, and because of this, his appointment was terminated. In eight, 1985, he was invited to a conference in England, this is a conference on group theory, but again, he couldn't attend because he was arrested. Um, despite all of this, he kept fighting uh, against, the, um, against apartheid. And after 1994, he was elected as a member of parliament and he served for three terms before retiring in 2009. So not only someone who um, contributed to mathematics, but also contributed to the country. Okay. And I would like to end my talk to, um, uh, with the uh, story of one person um, who is my collaborator, Loiso. Let's read a letter um, from Nick Heidemann, who's at the time at Rose University. This is dated 1977 to Rulof Forster in UNISA. Okay. Dear Rulof, there's a very bright black student at Fort Hare University who is doing an MSc jointly at Rhodes and Fort Hare. He is soaking up mathematics at a terrific rate and it is a real pleasure to have him in class. His name is Gordon Nongka. He will probably go overseas next year to do a PhD in mathematics. Before going, he should really have a wider contact with mathematicians and the various branches of the subject. I am very keen for him to join the society and come to the next Congress. I noticed from the latest membership list that there are at least two other black members. What arrangements have been made for blacks at the Bloemfontein Congress? Can they stay with other delegates at the hotel listed? And are the facilities at the Congress the same, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, sorry, the text did not come up. Okay, so um, this letter address to uh, uh, concerning the South African Mathematical Society Congress. And here you can also see that even attending a Congress was very, very difficult if you're not white at the time. Can you stay at the same hotel? Are the facilities the same and so on and so forth? So it's, it's, it was not really not, uh, a really unpleasant time. Okay, so um, let's talk about Loiso very quickly. He was born in 1953, uh, courtesy of Loiso. He was very kind to uh, give us this picture of his family. That's him there um, in the middle. If you know Loiso, you would uh, be very familiar with that big smile. He always have big smile on his face. <laughs> and here's a quote by Loiso. I came from a middle-class family. A number of people in my village were uneducated and didn't go beyond primary school. But because my parents went to secondary school, it was expected of us. So he uh, went to a boarding school 45 kilometers from his family. And at his school, because of Bantu education, um, no mathematics or physical sciences taught at his school. His English teacher, Mr. Kwezi Matila, suggested that he should study mathematics to better his career options, responding against the words of Forwood that we saw earlier. He then switched schools and enrolled in the, at the University of Fort Hare. But at the time, um, Fort Hare, uh, as I mentioned earlier, this whole, um, there was a segregation of, of um, education facilities. And in terms of education, they were, uh, formali uh, they were formally separated universities by race and ethnicity and Fort Hare uh, was uh, one of the so-called ethnic universities. So there were English medium universities, Afrikaans medium universities, and ethnic universities at the time. Okay, 
later, Loiso did master's degree again at Fort Hare, joined with uh, Rhodes University. And he received the Rhodes Scholarship. He's the black, first black person to receive the uh, Rhodes Scholarship in 1978. But this does not come easy. Um, the Bantu Homeland Citizenship Act of 1970 basically uh, said that blacks living throughout South Africa um, as legal citizens of homelands designated for their particular ethnic groups. What does this mean? This means that they are stripped from, the South, from their South African citizenship and they're, they're only have few remaining civil and political rights. So it's not so easy to travel when you're not citizen of South Africa, you don't have a passport. So he had to get a special travel document to enter the UK to study at Oxford. And this is not so nice because um, at, uh, he shared the story that um, at the time he went with two other students from South Africa with South African passport, and they could go around in Europe to attend conferences. Maybe there's a little bit of difficulty in applying for visa, but that's not so difficult, but he cannot do that. He, he couldn't do that because of this special travel document. He, can only, he could only remain in the UK. So this hinder also his, um, let's say, uh, this opportunity um, to attend conferences, which we all know is very important for us academics. And when he returned um, to South Africa, again, he was invited to attend conferences in Europe, but again, could not travel because of the situation. Uh, but he finally regained his citizenship in 1993. He visited Harvard under the Harvard South Africa Fellowship Program, which was designed for people like Loiso who did not have opportunity to travel um, under apartheid laws. And he subsequently became a vice chancellor and principal of the University of Witwatersrand for 10 years. And he was elected vice president of the IMU in 2018. So Loisa, as we all know, still active at the moment, contributing to uh, the mathematical community in particular in South Africa. And um, we're really thankful to have someone like him uh, in our community. Okay. So the end of apartheid came. And um, towards the end of this era, um, to combat academic boycott and academics living in South Africa, there were efforts um, made to restructure the research funding. So this happened mainly at the CSIR. And then um, the founding of the Foundation for Research Development in 1984 boosted the, re the research culture in South Africa. This is the precursor for the current NRF. Um, there was the national rating system and there's also development program for black universities. And slowly the universities of South Africa transformed to become research intensive the university and made it possible for more South African students to remain in the country for their doctoral degrees. Okay, so I will end with some conclusion um, and hopefully we can all learn from history and um, working together towards a better future of South African mathematics and South African uh, science in general. Um, we saw that the education system was implemented by European settlers, but then development of mathematics became uniquely South African as we, can, uh, we could see with the uh, works at the observatory and the mining industry. We also saw that mathematicians taking part in South African society, even from the beginning, um, like uh, James Rose Innes and um, Sidney Samuel Hugh and so on. South African students studied overseas, returned to South Africa and trained in the next generation. Um, training of South African students done both by both immigrants and also South African born researchers in the country. And we all saw that apartheid created setbacks for South African mathematicians, but then support, collaboration, visits, and funding created opportunities for South African mathematics to flourish. So this is our hope that in, in the future, there's more support, lots of collaboration. We get visits from um, international mathematicians and more funding so that we can um, create more uh, wonderful and um, come up with amazing mathematics from South Africa. Okay, I would like to end my talk here. Thank you very much for your attention. Ed, uh, thank you very much for a, for a fascinating talk. It was really nice uh, the, 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 that you shared so many insights in the history of mathematics that probably many of us didn't, didn't know. And, yeah. um, <laughs> and, I, <laughs> and I noticed that uh, um, there are no questions so far in the, in the Q&A, and that's probably <laughs> indication that everybody was just fascinated and, uh, 
uh, and listen. Yeah, but um, I see there are lots of mathematicians in the audience, so I would like to uh, encourage them maybe to raise their hand. I see here they come, uh, and um, and allow them to, uh, to 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 give us their 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 comments. I think the first one is is George Janelitze. Please. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, can I? Thank you. I don't yeah. know how to show myself, but... Uh, uh, maybe I can help you. Uh, uh -huh. No, I can't. <laughs> okay, uh, all right, it's all right. Yeah, yeah. So I... Um, uh, I'm going to... I'm going to criticize. But... Okay. Uh, I'm going to criticize, but before criticizing, I would like to say that this was a very, very interesting talk. And uh, he, I think every single point of this talk uh, was very, very well presented and interesting. Uh, the critical remark is that you cannot call this history of mathematics in South Africa because you, you picked up very nice, interesting points but it absolutely does not reflect. Uh, there is beautiful mathematics in South Africa, which uh, was absolutely never mentioned. Would you, would you okay. accept such a criticism? I would accept such a criticism, but also I have only short amounts of time to explain everything. So I apologize for that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think there is a very nice article by Ada that contains much more information. So, and I think Ada yes. mentioned it in the in, at the beginning of the presentation. Yeah. Uh, I think Timba Dube raised. Uh, Timba, you you're welcome to uh, unmute yourself and 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 ask your question or make your comments. And please, if there are other people that would like to comment, just uh, give me a sign, and we will give you the rights to talk. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Francesco. Am I unmuted? Uh, yes, we can hear you clearly. We cannot see you, but we can hear you clearly. No, thank you. Uh, mine is not a question. It's just a comment. You know? I remember Luiso told me one time that when he first attended, the, when, the first time he attended the SEMS conference, he was introduced by a, a, one of his lecturers at Forte, Tom van Dijk, who also taught me to some of, Tom, to some of the mathematicians at the University of Pretoria. And one of those people refused to shake Luiso's hand. That's how bad things were back then. Mm. And mm. much as it hurt Luiso, I think it also hurt Tom van Dijk because Tom yeah. was a sort of person who did not see color. He saw a mathematician, a capable young black mathematician. He, it was not an issue of he's black or white, he's just a capable person. I'm just mentioning that now, there mm. were among white people, even among male Africaners, who did not really buy into this discrimination thing. Mm -hmm. You believe that if you are capable, you are capable regardless of your gender, your race and everything. Just a comment. Yes. comment. Thank you. Thank you, Temba. Thank you very much. Uh, and I see Jacek joined us on the panel. Please, Jacek, you're welcome okay. to share your Hi, hi your Francesco. Hi, Ider. Thanks Hello, Jacek. For, for, for the talk. Uh, Okay. Now, I, I would like to just make a short comment uh, that it is probably sometimes worthwhile to remember that uh, Bantu Education Act was not an original uh, idea of uh, apartheid state and uh, fair world. Actually, almost, it was almost verbatim copied from what uh, Nazi, Nazis introduced in uh, conquered areas in, in the Eastern Europe. Precisely, exactly the same statements were uh, in force of in, in, in Poland, Ukraine, Belarus, and so on. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. so essentially, this, this act was copied from from old Nazi uh, Nazi regulations for occupied territories. Uh, so mm. okay, <laughs> okay, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, thank, thank you, you Ashok, for the comment. Yeah, thank you very much for bringing us to the modern politics. Yes. <laughs> What's happening and going wrong in the world these days. No, thank you very much. <laughs>
Um, and not, ah, sorry, I think there are a few questions. There's one question in, ah, in, in the, in the Q&A by an anonymous <laughs> attendee that has a very uh, practical question. And he asked, or he or she asked, what is the field of positivity all about? Maybe either you, you can answer quickly. Or, or, yeah. well, positivity concerns um, order, basically. So the, na the name positivity, um, I suppose, I think my positivity colleagues, please correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> um, uh, the the all, whole the idea here is um, having order, right? So you can um, order your elements in the space. And generally, you collect all, um, all the elements that we call positive, so greater than zero. And this forms a basically positive cone, as we usually call it in this in this in this area. And that's why the field um, is named positivity. It's coming from the idea of positive cone. Um, that's I think uh, my maybe my positivity colleagues can help me also in the chat. Um, uh, maybe someone else can <laughs> can explain I think it better. Ada, for the purposes of this talk, I think that's <laughs> I think this is enough. enough. <laughs> of a question. But before I ask the, 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 the next uh, uh, panelist to ask his question, uh, I see in the chat there is a little bit of interest on the nature of the instruments uh, oh, behind you. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you can uh, tell, share with us what instruments they are, because there are lots of people that are very interested. Lots of people. <laughs> yes, and I do have a fretless bass. It's fretless bass, not made in Indonesia. It's a, I don't know where it's made, actually. So it's, it's a Warwick brand. I bought it here. Um, there's a Japanese instrument there next to it, which I bought in Japan. I do have a ukulele, but it's probably not it's not seen. Um, and I've also a guitar there. <laughs> okay, maybe we. Uh, I think Zura suggests we should organize a demonstration, but maybe yeah, may, maybe a, some other time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but I see Setuti uh, um, uh, Moshokoa um, raise his hand, please. Uh, you're welcome to unmute yourself and and share with us your comments or your question. Yes, uh, thank you very much, and also Ida to the presenter. Uh, the talk was very enlightening in the sense that uh, we had to learn some of the things that uh, were happening you know, during uh, those uh, difficult years for mathematicians. Mm -hmm. But I think mm -hmm. also on the other line, there are also some mathematicians who actually left the country, going to Botswana, mm -hmm. going to Zimbabwe, yeah. like a professor, Sergio Salbani, the late Sergio Salbani, who also mm -hmm. contributed towards the development of mathematics in the country. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you. Thank you, Setuti. Thank you. Yes, maybe before I answer the next uh, question, I really appreciate all the comments from Yashek, from Setuti, from Pemba. Um, we have resources here and there, but there's lots of information and it's really difficult to process everything. And um, there's also still missing information. So if you know anything uh, from that period or things that are not recorded, please, um, if you could, um, contact me by email or Loiso is also fine. Um, we would really appreciate this for our future projects. This is still the beginning. There's still lots for us to explore. And uh, it's a big project that we're doing at the moment. And we really appreciate any comments or any resources from everybody. Ah, I see Ada, there is a um, Zurab. Uh, raise his hand, Zurab, please. You're welcome. Uh, thank you very much, Ada. Uh, so you mentioned future, uh, future plans. Uh, mm -hmm. Would you like to share with us uh, some directions in which you're thinking of going in the future in terms of the history? Yeah, so uh, at the moment we were looking into, um, for instance, talking more into the, um, the, the well, the, the specific aspect that we can talk about, like the doctoral training in South Africa, that's one, one aspect of it. And also um, in terms of people who are who were rated from the beginning um, uh, of the of the rating system, which was introduced in the 80s, um, for instance, who were the people um, receiving A rating, B rating, P rating, um, and so on, and who were uh, what about the demographic? What does it say? And what can we learn from this? So that's one of the things that we're looking at at the moment. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Zara. Thank you. And um, and now we have uh, Charles. Um, um, oops, um, I'm not sure how to pronounce your surname, Charles. Sipa, uh, you're welcome, Charles, to, to, to ask your question or make your comment. Uh, Charles, you just need to unmute yourself. 
Can you hear me now? Ah, yeah, now yes. we can hear Charles. Perfect. Thank you very much. Yeah, my comment is a kind of a, a question. I think uh, there's no one who's got a doubt that uh, the status of mathematics at like uh, at research level, at tertiary and all that is uh, excellent. But there's always one question which is always running through my mind that why does this filter into improving the school system in as far as mathematics and sciences are concerned? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then what I would actually want, uh, I would actually love if someone could investigate how does it happen that we've got such illustrious mathematicians yeah. at tertiary, but this doesn't filter the school and influence some kind mm -hmm. of positive change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That needs to be investigated as far as I'm concerned. I think this, mm -hmm. that's a very, very interesting thing to look at yeah. and think about it. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah, you very thank much you. for that comment. Yeah, thank you very much for that comment. I think this is one thing that all of us have been struggling with. We don't know how to fix it. Um, we don't know where to start. We don't know what the actual problem is. Maybe it's as complex as as the history itself, um, something, yeah, something that we need to discuss going into the future. I agree. Yeah, no, thank you, Charles, for that comment. Maybe you mm. might be interested to know, Charles, that next month, that means next week, essentially, uh, we, we start, or this, at the end, this Friday, uh, we start a kind of a math school for grade 12 learners to, 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 to repeat the, 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 the curriculum. Uh, and um, we, we just start next week. <laughs> so, so that, but we hope to, to build it up in something more substantial. But of course, like Ada said, something that needs to be understood. And, uh, and action, yeah? <laughs> which is way more urgent. Yeah? Even we, if we don't understand it correctly, we need to do something. Yeah? Yeah. We, we, mm -hmm. all, we all agree on that. But I see Benjamin uh, raise his hand. Please, Benjamin. Thank you. Um, I just want to congratulate the researcher for, uh, for the amazing talk. However, I wanted to ask, um, most of um, the cases cited in this talk tend to be Eurocentric and South Africa. Yeah. Was there no possibility that there were also like intra-Africa, just like someone had mentioned earlier in Zimbabwe, but also yeah. across yeah. different parts of Africa? Because I, I'm a Nigerian and I know that Nigeria used to have yeah. some famous mathematicians yeah. where they know either some kind of effort of, of some sort with Black South Africans to help mm -hmm. in mathematics or any of that. Or, I mean, maybe your project could also look at possibility of finding such traces if there was ever maybe people sent to Nigeria for study during the apartheid, right. Right. are there chances of that? that? That was just what my question was about. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your, uh, for your question. I, at the moment, will answer that question with I don't know. Um, perhaps there were resources and information that were still missing, we, whether we are not aware of the information or the information was not written somewhere, but um, I remember reading um, there were two mathematicians that um, taught, uh, I don't remember where, I think Fort Hare was one of them, so two black mathematicians, um, but they did not complete um, their education until PhD level, only until master's level, but they were influential in terms of educating people there. So um, I, this was a recent finding, so uh, I did not uh, in, include it yet in this version of the talk. Maybe in the future, I would also include that. But yeah, thank you for thank your you. comment. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Benjamin. And um, Zura uh, raise his hand again. Zura, please, you're welcome. Uh, thanks. I just wanted to make uh, a comment that's my own personal uh, perspective on what Charles pointed out about the, uh, the correlation right. between school, um, um, school level and uh, uh, possible excellence of research mathematics. Um, so I'm not I'm not saying that this is the, the the reason why, but I can I can explain. Well, I mean I can you know, say what I think about why there is no interaction between the two worlds, and I think it goes back to the fact that there is very little interaction at university between uh, lecturers, uh, mathematics lecturers who are research mathematicians and students who want to become teachers. Mm -hmm. um, what I've seen at Stellenbosch, as well as 
in my own university in Georgia is that uh, it was a kind of stereotype that those who want to become teachers, they're usually the ones who don't necessarily get very high grades. It's not true because mm -hmm. I've seen uh, in Stellenbosch, I've seen a lot of students, very, very good achievers who later become teachers. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, there is not as intimate interaction between the two as yeah. you would have, for example, between someone who wants to in the future become a researcher and a professor. Mm -hmm. So I think, and, and this also lack of interaction is also supported by the fact that we have education faculties um, taking care of primary um, teachers, right? So that's even more isolation between mm -hmm. uh, research mathematicians and, mm -hmm. and teachers. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not saying that if there was more interaction, we would do any better, but uh, at least I can say well, that the interaction, I think, breaks mm -hmm. In the university level, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Zurab. Thank you, Zurab, and I think Jacek has also a comment. Yeah, I just just just, just uh, follow up on the previous speaker. I don't know whether uh, I mean you had uh, you know about Paulus Gerdes or Herdes uh, and Ahmed Jebar. Uh, there are people in in the African Mathematical Union who. Uh, I mean, uh, had run uh, before uh, Kerdes mm. died uh, section or uh, commission on history uh, history of uh, African mathematics, and uh, so they they have quite a lot of. of uh, I remember that they had quite a lot of data information about about African mathematics. Jabbar is a specialist for essentially Maghreb uh, Maghreb mathematics, but Kerdes was quite interested in in central. Africa. There is, I think he wrote a few books. Uh, it's African history, for example, and cultures, uh, an annotated bibliography in 2007 mm. and so on. So probably if, if you want to extend uh, your study for, you know, to, to cover mat African mathematics or sub-Saharan African mathematics, then, then this is probably the first, first port of call, I would say. Right. Thank you, Atrek. Thank you, Atrek. Okay. Thank you. Uh, either I don't see any more questions or, or raised hands. So, uh, so maybe this, ah, uh, Jacek, uh, sorry, I think, uh, here we go again. <laughs> I spoke too early. Uh, Jacek raised No, I was hand. trying to, to, I was trying to lower my hand probably. Ah, no, I, sorry, I, I, yeah. I lowered it for you. <laughs> yeah, okay, so. <laughs> No, no problem. So, Ida, sorry, the, 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 it looks like there are no more questions, but uh, uh, you, you, you heard that uh, there were many questions, many comments, so you really hit the nerve and, and addressed a topic that is of, uh, of interest and relevance to, to all of us. So thank you very much for, for your thank time, you. Ida, and in particular for, for, for investing lots of your time in, uh, in, in, in studying this. Yeah? So thank you very much. So thank as soon you. as you have some new insight, please let us know and we are most than of happy to, to, to invite you again to, uh, to update us. Yeah? <clears throat> and, Thank and you, Francesco. You, yeah, absolute pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> and before we leave, just a reminder to the participants that uh, Ada kindly agreed to join us uh, for a short while in our uh, NITEX uh, social virtual room. I posted the link again in the, in the chat. And, uh, and your browser should have opened on that page uh, automatically because of some Zoom magic. Yeah. So, Ida, thank you very much. Uh, thank, thank you very you. much to all the participants. I hope to see some of you in, uh, in Kumo space where the drinks are always free. Uh, and, um, and if you don't join us, have all a nice evening. And uh, we're looking forward to see you again uh, uh, next Monday. We will be here again with another interesting talk. So, Ida, thank you very much. I'll see you thank just you. now in, in another. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, day. everybody. Thank you.